mean, if you're watching me on YouTube, I'm dressed like a, I don't know, like a, a gangster man. I don't know what I'm wearing. I'm dressed like a Gopnik. You don't know what a Gopnik is. It's uh, basically a Soviet Union homeless uh, thug. I've got no reflective design logic on today. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. And today on the show, we've got some code cracking. In fact, we're going to learn a little secret language, which I've been teaching people for years on how to make money out of real estate. Yes, today you are learning a language. And I tell you what, it's not going to be Japanese, Polish or Swedish Today, we are learning the secret language of real estate. Yes, folks, real estate absolutely has a language. It speaks to people. People have a love affair with property in Australia. The right property speaks the language of real estate. And I tell you what, they even make TV shows out of the language of real estate. If you've ever watch the block, you're probably fascinated with the secret language of property. So today we're going to go through what the secret language is and why learning it is so important to real estate success. Once you understand the language, you can absolutely cream it. You can make bucket loads of money and of course create great revenue from rents because your property will stand out from a very, very crowded market. Hey, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks for all the messages from all the different listeners, getting some great feedback about the show. So really looking forward to giving you some more insights into real estate. I'm coming to you Saturday morning. Usually I do my recordings for this podcast on a Friday, but I tell you what, those damn hearth and homers were out yesterday blasting the neighborhood with chainsaws and whippersnippers and looking after their grass. I tell you what, hearth and homers are one part of the consumer puzzle which I just have a battle with. If you haven't heard the hearth and homer episode, go back a few podcasts fundamentally There are house-proud people in Australia and they don't stop looking after their houses. In fact, instead of going out to play sport, instead of going out for a surf or a bike ride, they're at home mowing the lawn. And guess what? The lawn doesn't need mowing. The big challenge for me, of course, I'm working from home these days and I've realised my neighbourhood is full of hearth and homers. They love looking after their house. And one of the reasons they love looking after their house is they actually are speaking this secret language of real estate. See, in property, there are so many different properties out in the marketplace and, of course, so many different types of people. There are very logical buyers in the property marketplace And for the most part, investors are very logical. Investors make decisions on logical analytics. We love data. What's happening in a neighbourhood? What's happening in the market? Where's the supply levels? How do the rents perform? These are all logical questions. But here's the real truth of real estate. No one cares about the logical part. Everyone is emotionally attached to property People buy real estate using their heart, not their head. They will create some logical conclusions to justify their emotional decision when it comes to buying real estate. For us investors, we need to understand that if we're too logical about property and only buy real estate based on a mathematical formula, we actually might miss the biggest part of the marketplace, which is the marketplace where people love real estate. Hearth and homers, they are buying property to nest. They have some 
connection to the real estate. So the real estate, which in my portfolio has performed the best over the years, has always spoken this secret language. It's always connected at a human level with human beings. So I think it's so important today in a very crowded marketplace to understand what makes human beings tick when it comes to buying real estate. So today on the show, we're going to go over the real science of why certain properties, which can be in marketplaces all over the country, get absolutely incredible prices. If you ever wondered why a property goes to auction and perhaps it's worth $700,000 on paper, but the day of auction, people just fall in love with the property. And yeah, there's a bit of a bidding war. And of course, someone walks away owning the property, not for $700,000, but for $850,000. Records get set all the time in real estate. And you quite often find it's properties that have this little secret language going on that tend to get this really exceptional level of capital growth. Remember, our job as a property investor is to buy real estate, which is going to replace our income. And we need to understand real estate is, for the most part, very homogenous. Homogenous just simply means real estate is very similar to each other. Here in Australia, we actually need a new property every three minutes and 55 seconds. Every three minutes and 55 seconds. In New Zealand, it's something like every seven minutes and 50 seconds. So you can imagine every three minutes and 55 seconds, a new property is pumped out in Australia. As you can probably garnish from that data, there is some pretty incredibly bad real estate being produced. In fact, one of the biggest challenges in both Australia and New Zealand is real estate is being produced like rubbish. You compile the new stock which is being produced, 75% of it is absolute crap. Then you go a step further and you look at structurally what is available on the secondhand property marketplace. And you'll find that fundamentally most of the stock available is also past its use by date. It no longer can speak the secret language of real estate. I teach the big four Ds. Yes, four Ds. Dead stock, dying stock, dysfunctional stock, and desirable stock. I'll say it again. Dead stock, dying stock, dysfunctional stock, and desirable stock. Here's the challenge. 75% of real estate, either brand new or secondhand, is either dead, dying, or dysfunctional. Only 25% of the real estate in the marketplace is what I would call desirable stock, either brand new or secondhand. One of the challenges for property investors is to avoid dysfunctional, dying, or dead stock. The challenge, of course, with that stock is it cannot be brought back to life without a complete knockdown and starting again. In other words, today around all of our cities, in our uh, country towns, we have a lot of real estate which is archaic. The way it is designed is dysfunctional. In fact, some of the building materials can be quite hazardous. You've got things like asbestos, you've got uh, poor built properties. You've got properties built based on another era. Many properties which were produced, for example, were produced as three bedrooms with one bathroom. But today, families want four bedroom, two bathroom. 
So we have this misalignment in the real estate world. And what truly people want is undersupplied. And quite often property investors have this real challenge with the real estate market. We talk about supply a lot, but supply is not a linear concept. Supply is based on four separate sections. Do we have enough supply of desirable real estate? The answer is no. So of course, to buy desirable real estate would make sense because there's less offered. Do we have a lot of homogenous real estate? Dysfunctional 40-year-old homes? Yes. Do we have a lot of dysfunctional apartments which are 60-year-old walk-ups? Yes. Do we have a lot of dysfunctional brand new properties? Yes. Do we have a lot of dying stock which if you were to go and try and renovate it, you would have to structurally completely change the property because it is so different to what the market expects today that it is fundamentally past its cycle point. It is dying. The answer, of course, is yes. And do we have dead stock? Well, I think you could easily drive around just about any neighbourhood and you would spot the house or the apartment complex, which really should probably be pulled down. You know it visually, Human beings are visual and part of the secret language of real estate is all about understanding that human beings are also visual. So I tell you what, we want to concentrate on the desirable stock. Remember the big four Ds, dead stock, dying stock, dysfunctional stock and desirable stock. Today's show is really about understanding the desirable stock. Why do we want the desirable stock? It is undersupplied. In fact, there are studies on so many different deals that if they speak the secret language of property, despite market conditions, they can fetch huge amounts. I've personally bought and personally seen properties in marketplaces which have had 0% capital growth in the market, a 0% capital growth in the suburb go up by 10 or 20% on sale. Why? They speak the secret language. So remember, we want the desirable real estate. They rent better, they avoid downturns, they resell better, and they get you extra elements of wealth. Now think about this. We buy real estate quite often and we play this kind of game. We want to replace our income. We want to get debt free. We want to live off passive property rent. To live off passive property rent for many people, if they have a number in mind, they probably have a number of around $100,000. To live off $100,000 in rental income from real estate you're probably going to need around $2 million worth of rental real estate paid off, owned outright. To achieve that milestone, you're probably going to have to buy some real estate that you own and sell to pay down the debt on the real estate you want to keep. Here's the real truth of real estate. You make your money buying it and you make even more money selling it. The day you sell, you can absolutely see some huge amounts of unexpected gains. This is where the secret language of real estate really comes into its own. Can you imagine you've bought a property for $400,000? You've kept it for 20 years. It's now gone up, it's seen market cycles, it's seen structural changes in the market economy. It's gone from four hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars. You are now sitting on a big chunk of wealth. You want to take that four hundred thousand dollars you've made, you want to go and pay off one of your other properties. The day you go to auction or the day you go to sale is a big moment. And this is what can happen. 
if your property speaks the right language, you won't sell it for eight hundred. You'll sell it for eight fifty, eight seventy five, nine fifty. If it doesn't speak the secret language of real estate, what will happen is instead of selling it for eight hundred, you'll be selling it for seven twenty five or seven hundred, or on a good day you'll get seven fifty. So the variation of wealth of what I'm talking about is absolutely hundreds of thousands of dollars. And of course, property investors often forget this one because property investors like the idea of quite often dead, dysfunctional or dying real estate. And I've got the lashes on my back for going into that space myself. I've bought real estate which is dysfunctional, it's got terrible flow, it's got terrible floor plans and it's too expensive to rectify based on what it is worth. I've bought real estate which has been well past its use by date, bought real estate which is already 40 years old and 15 years later the properties are now 55 years old structurally they need a lot of work and attention they are dying real estate and you can imagine the health care of a dying person it's the same concept of dying real estate requires a lot of health care a lot of maintenance a lot of ongoing upkeep so the desirable real estate is secondhand or brand new properties which we can easily renovate or we can design from the get-go brand new, which are going to speak this most amazing language to human beings. Of course, I'll give you the language soon. But the secret language of property does so much for people. It creates real wealth. Remember, if we had a dysfunctional 60-year-old property, it's not going to rent well and it probably isn't going to resell for a high amount. Brand new properties, which are also dysfunctional, which are cookie-cutter designs, do not resell well. And for the most part, don't even rent well. What we're looking for, if we are going to speak the secret language of real estate, is really good brand new or secondhand properties which are unique and have the right elements that people prefer. Here's some real statistics. Here in Australia, you know, 75% of tenants would pay more in rent if the stock was better. In other words, so many people are renting properties they actually do not want to rent because they are simply not available. The ones that are available get really good rental demand. They have low vacancy rates. They are first choice of the tenant pool. People want to rent them because they are good. They are desirable. And of course, what that ends up creating is kind of like this disflationary versus inflationary property. A deflationary property is a piece of real estate where the value in rental return keeps dropping every year because the property just simply gets worse and worse. The cost to run that property, though, keeps going up because of inflation. Rates go up, strata fees go up, uh, insurances go up. So you get this kind of dichotomy of ownership the polar opposite is desirable properties the rents continue to go up on them and of course same issue you do get inflation in costs but your costs are met by the inflation in the result of the real estate now remember i teach the 4x growth plan four times growth we want to make our money buying the right property. We want to make our money choosing the right location. We want to beat the market at its own game by buying in a marketplace which has got future growth potential. 
In other words, if Sydney's just boom, don't buy in Sydney. Buy in a marketplace which is going to grow next. Remember, right property, right location, right market, but also I teach behavioral economic influences for the 4X growth plan. The fourth part of the puzzle is behavior. What behaviors do real estate have that influence further and better capital growth over and above buying well, buying a great location, and buying a very good marketplace? Behavioral growth is as much about the day you sell as it is the journey you go on. And most property investors forget the idea of behavioral growth. For me, there are lots of different ways you can create behavioral growth from real estate. It could be walkable. It could be a mobile property. It could be a property which has got great proximity. It could be a real estate with a great orientation. So we need to understand that there is a lot of homogenous real estate. We need new property every three minutes and 55 seconds. We know the old real estate world is structurally not keeping up with what people want. People can't upgrade. No one's upgrading because there's nothing to upgrade to. It's structurally flawed. Who wants to upgrade to a 55-year-old home? It, it doesn't exist. Who wants to upgrade to a brand new home 60 kilometers from the city? All of a sudden, there is a void, and it's this void which I'm so interested in. If you can buy in the void and, of course, bring some great design to your real estate growth, you're going to speak the language. Now, I like to sort of position it this way. The Forex growth plan is a simple plan. You buy well, and if you buy well, you're probably going to earn anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20% on your purchase. In other words, you buy a property for $500,000, you're getting a good deal, you got 10% off, well, you're making 50 grand. The right area, though, is worth at least 20%. If you choose the right suburb, even in a low market, the right neighborhood could bounce up as much as 20%. Right street, right suburb, 20% worth of growth. So that $500,000 property is actually going to get $100,000 worth of its future gain from area. The market does a lot of the work though. And we need to understand if we buy well, if we buy a great location, we're going to still need a structural change in the market for a huge amount of growth to occur. Generally, that happens over a longer period. And if you can imagine, we've bought in this $500,000 property, we've made 50 grand from buying well, we've made 100 grand from choosing the right location. Now we're going to need another 350 grand for this property to go from $500,000 to a million dollars. Our goal, of course, is to see our real estate double in value. Why do we want it to double in value? Well, we want to use it to pay down debt or we want to keep it if it's going to have a really good income profile. The fourth part of the puzzle is over market growth, the behavioral growth, the day you sell. You could expect to go backwards or forwards. And this is where, again, if your property speaks the elements of human design, you will do really, really well, okay? So there are three human elements that human beings want to see when they walk into an apartment, a townhouse, or a home. If your property speaks this language, the odds are you're going to end up in a very good place when it comes to future growth. Now, remember, quite often, buying real estate makes people anxious. You've got to understand that average person looking for a property is scared. They don't see anything but danger. Danger. So... 
if your property, either for rent or for sale, is looking dangerous, then people will not pay you a premium for it. And what I mean by that, if they walk in and it's got old carpet, danger. If they walk in and the kitchen's 50 years old, danger. If they walk in and the kitchen's some Bunnings job, danger. Danger, 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 danger. So human beings will discount for danger. Now, remember the four parts of the four Ds, desirable, dysfunctional, dying, or dead. When they see dying, dead, or dysfunctional, the first thing people do is discount because they see danger. People don't like owning things. It gives them anxiety. People today, really, we've engineered a generation of people who are now thinking of not owning things. I don't want to own a car. I'm going to car share. I don't want to own something. It's going to make me anxious. So we need to understand that much of the market is completely anxious. When they walk into a property to rent it, to view it, they are not thinking how you thought. You might have been very crafty and analytical and I'm going to buy this property this brand new property because it's cheaper than the one up the street well hang on a minute that brand new property which was cheaper up the street has an inferior floor plan inferior amenities inferior tapware inferior uh, build quality all of a sudden people get anxious when they walk in it they're like hang on a minute the powerpoint doesn't is not even in the right place see there is so many buying mistakes that people don't realize. And I think the biggest lesson of the mistakes so many people make is not understanding the secret language of real estate. So, I tell you what, it's time to talk about the secret language. I'm going to give you three human traits which people want from real estate so that when you go and buy real estate or renovate real estate, you think about these human core needs. Remember, some marketplaces have had no growth, but they've had real estate resell in them for hundreds of thousands of dollars more because, again, they speak a language. They speak the right language quality of design and what they ultimately speak for people is not anxiety but happiness yes happiness isn't that an interesting thought that real estate can make people happy if your real estate makes someone happy they're going to pay more for it in rent and in future growth so for me i like to teach people that for it to begin with people are visual so how we connect and interface with people is visual we show properties which are visual and of course properties appear online and really are liked based on their visual appeal if you think about today's world, we live in a social visual world. We actually are part of a visual experiment. If you want to impress someone, you're visually doing it through Instagram or Facebook. For a lot of people today, they will go to a restaurant and post what they're eating, a visual look at avocado on toast and they will put it on their Facebook profile. Hey, I'm having the visual avocado on toast. We need to understand that human beings have a big, big love of everything visual. Social media wouldn't exist if it wasn't for our visual sense. And so... Quite often what happens to property investors is they do analytics, but analytics are not visual. 
No one cares about the data coming out about a suburb. No one cares. You can listen to every podcast ever about data. People are probably tuning out. The data guys hate it because they're like, oh, but the data says. Mate, no one cares about the data. They care about if the home is going to make them happy, a visual experience. And if the visual experience is a exceptional experience, you're going to end up with this secret language. So the first visual experience that people like to experience is what is known as functional design. Functional design is exactly what it is. If you can imagine you walk into one home and it's got two living rooms, it's got a big open plan kitchen and dining area, it's got functional storage, it's ergonomically got a lot of space, or you work into another property which is perhaps part of the dysfunctional part of the marketplace, and it's a rabbit warrant. It would need a lot of work to bring up to what functional means to people today. And of course, if you don't have good functionality in your real estate, in your floor plans, you're going to run into a problem. And this is where, again, a lot of apartment buyers, townhouse buyers and home buyers end up buying a completely terrible floor plan. There is no traffic flow and they end up buying a rabbit warren. Of course, for people to visually connect with a property and also feel something when they walk through the property, the more functional the space is, the better result for you as a property investor, the better result the day you sell. Remember, there are so many dysfunctional properties. In fact, most properties today are produced in a completely undesirable manner. We need a new property every three minutes and 55 seconds, every seven minutes and 50 seconds in New Zealand. And what is being produced, we need to understand that we want the best of what is being produced. What is structurally in the market is, for the most part, not appropriate to what people actually want. So we need to, if we're choosing secondhand, go and find the appropriate stock. People will pay huge amounts of money for the right functional design. The second design part of the puzzle is known as reflective design logic. Remember, the first design logic is functional design logic. The second logic is reflective design logic logic. What is reflective design logic? Well, we as human beings all love reflective design. Have you ever wondered why a guy buys a Rolex watch? You can tell the time from your iPhone. What on earth do you need with a Rolex watch worth $35,000? Well, it is what is known in human psychology as reflective design. In fact, most brands work off reflective designs. If you can imagine, girls love a $10,000 handbag from Prada. Reflective design logic. You could cruise around with a $30 handbag, but it has no reflective or outbound design appeal. I mean, if you're watching me on YouTube, I'm dressed like a, I don't know, like a, a gangster man. I don't know what I'm wearing. I'm dressed like a gopnik. If you don't know what a gopnik is, it's uh, basically a Soviet Union homeless uh, thug. I've got no reflective design logic on today. 
But reflective design really drives people bonkers. They love it. If someone walks into a home or an apartment or a townhouse and they see nice engineered flooring, they see a great kitchen, they see awesome lighting, they see feature lamps, they see feature panelled cabinetry, they see stone, they see uh, splashbacks which are just freaking awesome, they see home automation, they see bathtubs, they, they see all of these things, all of a sudden they feel that their status is going to be better. Now, it's the same concept as the Rolex watch. You don't own a Rolex watch to tell the time. You own a Rolex watch to show off status. Reflective energy in real estate absolutely shows off status. And again, if a family went to buy a property, I guarantee you with a real estate with no reflective energy, uh, probably that family's again getting anxious over that property. They're like, well, we're going to have to bring the reflective energy. We're going to have to upgrade it. We're going to have to do this because it doesn't have it. Now, Donald Trump, the big D, has got the coronavirus, big, uh, the big corona. Before Donald Trump was the United States president, um, Donald Trump was a reflective design developer. He built buildings based on reflective energy. Trump Towers is a reflective design building. People live in it to say, guess what? I live in Trump Towers. And of course, what that does is create more value, more resale. Of course, maybe right now, I don't know, maybe it, it doesn't because everyone hates the Trump, but before he was the President of the United States, the idea was reflective design energy. And I use Donald Trump because everyone understands it. If you go to Fifth Avenue in New York, you're seeing Trump Towers. It's reflective. It's saying, I can do this. Follow me. I am number one. Reflective energy, no different to the Prada handbag, no different to the Rolex watch. Again, in real estate, reflective energy is often seen in locations or in the property itself. And we quite often see that in real estate within the property in fixtures, fittings, inclusions. If you walk into a property and it's dour, it's got no light, it's got no energy, it doesn't reflect it, you can't look in the mirror and see a result of feeling more aspirational around that. Now, remember, people are attached to a visual meaning of beauty. The fact that, again, uh, people Instagram constantly, it's all about the idea of reflective meaning. It is the idea that today we want to showcase that we have some beautiful energy in what we have, what we do, what we own. So we do want a nice level of reflection coming out of our real estate. The third part of the puzzle is behavioral design logic. Behavioral design logic. Does your real estate create a behavior which transforms someone's life. Now, here's the thing. If your real estate has nothing good in it and it's just a box, it has probably no behavioral design logic. So let me explain. Human beings buy things because they actually either want to reflect a bit of energy, they want to create more functionality in their life, or they want to create a behavior in their life which changes their life. Behavioral energy is all about the idea that 
if you buy something, you get a behavior with it. Now, I'm just going to use some easy examples so you understand what I'm talking about. Let's imagine we had a really prestigious home and it had a tennis court. You don't only get the home, but you get the behavior of being able to play tennis. If you have a home with a pool, you get the behavior of the home, but you also get the behavior of being able to swim. If you own a property in a complex with a pool, your apartment is an apartment where someone could live, but also swim. So we need to understand that behavioral design logic is rather important to real estate. It doesn't just have to be something monumental like a pool or a tennis court. It can be things which really are simple, but absolutely create a behavior that people want to buy. For example, some people in society like having a bath. So many properties don't have bathtubs. By buying a property with a bathtub or adding a bathtub if you're trying to upgrade a better uh, part of the marketplace, a design part of the marketplace, then you're creating the behavior of bathing. And of course, this is what people pay for. There are so many homogenous properties which have no behavioral design logic. Remember the big four, dead properties, dying properties, dysfunctional properties, and desirable properties. Now, desirable properties can come without behavioral design logic. Your job is to look at it and go, well, this is a pretty desirable property. It's in a really good location. It's a little bit old, but I can add new flooring. I can update the aesthetics. I can put some lipstick on this property. Or if it's a new property, I can, yeah, the brand new development came with carpet because that's what was offered. But if I just put timber flooring down, I'm going to have an aesthetically much better property. But let's not stop there. Where the window is, let's put a little breakfast bar there. By putting a breakfast bar at the window, I've created a behavior of, crea of having breakfast at the window. All of a sudden, the idea that homes and apartments and townhouses offer behaviors is so important. It is so important. This is where most property investors fail, fail miserably. The scorecard for property investors on the three design logics of human beings, functional, reflective, and behavioral, scorecard one out of 10. I like to train people to go down this road because when you've got a pretty well-designed property, whether it's old or new, you are going to speak the language of real estate to people. Don't end up buying a dysfunctional property. It will just get you nowhere. To rip a dysfunctional property apart and add functional, reflective and behavioral design, you might as well have bought a brand new property. A dying property is something which is just going to tear up cash out of your back pocket. You might as well take the 50 bucks out of your pocket right now and rip it up. You're going to tear up cash. Do not buying the dying and the dead. Well, you're probably not going to buy the dead because the dead is something you're probably visually looking at right now on the internet thinking, holy cow, what would you even do with that property? That thing's dead. Properties die. Properties go on life support, health care. Properties are dysfunctional like humans. You want to buy the absolute desirable stuff. If you're buying second hand, you want to add functional, uh, reflective and behavioral design. If you're buying new, you get the choice of actually looking for functional, behavioral and reflective. And really, some of that comes into some more lessons into the future. In fact, I wanted to do this show today to prep you so we can go on an even more detailed journey 
on how to choose some good real estate in the marketplace. But unless you can speak the secret language of real estate, I think it's almost virtually impossible to talk about renovating or buying pre-construction or building. You've got to understand how human beings think to go into that pocket of conversation. The secret language is what real estate is ultimately all about. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed the show. I've certainly enjoyed bringing you this lesson about uh, the secret language of real estate. Hey, thanks for your time. I will catch you again soon. Uh, Feel free to leave me a review. Uh, Hope you're enjoying the shows. Catch you on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.